a former colleague of mine had this phrase, engage me or enrage me. So if they're engaged, like, you know, you've won out. Like, um, you're not going to have to deal with as many classroom management issues. And it's with that frame of mind that Dr. Simon Crook went about founding Crooked Science, a STEM education consultancy that works with schools right across Australia. No wonder he's on the hot list for The Educator Magazine 2017. You're listening to the Physics Ed Podcast. For hundreds of ideas, free experiments and more, go to physicseducation.com.au. And now, here's your host, Ben Newsom. Yes, welcome back to another Physics Ed Podcast. This week, we are speaking with Simon Crook, who used to be a senior e-learning advisor for the Catholic Education Office in Sydney. He's an ex-high school science teacher of 15 years, by the way, but nowadays he is running Crooked Science, which takes him right across Australia to help out schools teach science, and especially with the new syllabus coming up in HSE Physics and others. Now, Simon is an accomplished author. He's written over 15 articles in national and international journals, and he finds a lot of his work being featured in various national media outlets such as the ABC and so on. So with all that, plus he's an honorary associate of the School of Physics at the University of Sydney, you bet Simon Crook's got a lot to say when it comes to STEM education. This is the Physics Ed Podcast. Thank you, Ben. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, considering um, that you've just done a big mission back up from Aubrey only recently, uh, your work takes you all over the place. Yes, it does at the moment. So I'm, I'm running Crooked Science as a, if you like, STEM education consultancy. So that, that gives me a, quite a variety of work. When I started out just uh, under three years ago, uh, it was when the new science and technology syllabus came out in primary schools. And there was a lot of needs there, so to speak, uh, for support for primary teachers uh, around the new syllabus and the greater accountability. And, you know, there's a lot of desire there in uh, among primary teachers to um, make science fun in the classroom. So I particularly say, um, starting out about three years ago, I was doing a lot of work with primary schools in and around Sydney, but also across New South Wales. And now this year, uh, the new HSC uh, physics syllabus has come out, and physics is my background. And there's a big, there's a big need by teachers across New South Wales uh, with preparing for this new syllabus. So uh, yet again, this is taking me on the road. So uh, yeah, Albury, Gunnedah, Kelso, Dubbo, Coffs, um, lots in Sydney. And this is unsurprising so, yeah. considering it's November 2017, Teachers are, you know, you know, wiping their brows, just about done with term four. But hang on, you've got to plan for next year. And now they're rolling new syllabus out. That's going to make it fun. Well, this is it. So, I mean, you know, teachers are busy, busy people. And um, they're going to have to start teaching this syllabus, you know, end of January, beginning of February next year. And uh, it's interesting going around working with so many teachers. Um, some of them haven't had time to plan. Uh, they haven't had time themselves. They haven't been provided with time. So there's, yeah, there's a massive need out there. And I think there's you know, anything I can do to help uh, assist them and, you know, um, minimize any anxiety and to empower them. Um, I'm trying to do as much as I can. What's the feedback with um, people with the new syllabus? What, what's their feelings on the ground, so to speak? Like, are, are they happy with it? Is, it? is it something they're like, you know what, mm could be better. Like, I mean, obviously everyone's got opinions, let's be honest, and they're all going to give it, give it out to you. Just, just yeah. a one, like, as a barometer, I mean, getting to see people face-to-face, away from the brass, away from the leadership, just hearing from the ground. I mean, what, what are they sort of thinking about the new one coming up? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I've actually written an article about this uh, in the conversation um, when it first came out. The, the, the overall response from people is people are very happy. Sometimes physics, you know, can be associated with a bit of, say, intellectual snobbery. Um, I see it as being more just, you know, attention to detail and um, being pedantic. But there's there's a lot more mathematical rigor in this new syllabus, which a lot of people are very happy with. And there's a lot less of the perhaps um, social kind of commentary that was in the that's in the current syllabus. So that, you know, in answer to your question, that's probably the overall feel. However, it's not as straightforward as that. I mean, there were some unfortunate comments. I think it was Michelle Simmons from UNSW labelled the current syllabus as being feminised. Um, right. I mean, we shouldn't be apportioning ge- gender, uh, particularly in a derogatory fashion, um, you know, to a syllabus. That's possibly taken out of context, but it was reported widely in the SMH in places. 
at the same time, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. So the current syllabus has context and a lot of narrative. And I know the Science Teachers Association are conscious that we don't want to lose that. Now, experienced teachers will continue that into the new syllabus, which has less context uh, within the way that it's written. But for any new teachers coming in or training teachers who won't know any of the syllabuses, they perhaps might not have that narrative and the context and, and bringing things together almost like in, you know, with a storyline, so to speak. So I would implore any experienced physics teachers who get training, you know, physics teachers or new physics teachers under their wing to really encourage them to, to maintain that because, you know, it's not like the current syllabus is diabolical. It's the things that have to change. And at the same time, and I have to be careful what I say here, you know, the, the, there are still, you know, some things that are being ironed out in, in the current syllabus. So there are some changes that are made early doors. I mean, NESA had... Uh, a lot of pressure to get so many syllabuses out in, in um, a short space of time. Uh, I've heard various stories in terms of what funding they may or may not have been given to uh, assist with, say, the proofreading and uh, quality assurance and the like. So they have made some kind of amendments and uh, published some errata, and I believe there's going to be a few more coming out soon, which would be ironic for those people that have done a lot of work in terms of running the programs, if there's a few things to change. Well, the good news uh, is, is, I mean, school practice and curriculums and syllabuses, they roll and they change over time and with feedback and research and all the rest. And um, that's a good news. I mean, it, it's good that it changes and always, you know, ruffles feathers here and there and it makes other people happy. Then they look at it and redo it and go again and that type of thing. I mean, I understand that you're involved in, um, you know, physical education research, if, you know, yeah, you know, back in the day, and actually, you only just really just finished, haven't you, on the research side? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did just very quickly, just on the syllabus um, before I talk about my research there. Yeah. One, one of the strengths of being in education today, say to you know the, the turn of millennium, which is when the last syllabus came out, is we do have modern technology, so things can change. And I do know that some senior people in NESA are very keen to almost have like a dynamic syllabus. That is a real strength, and. Some of the other things that have come out uh, within this that are really strong are things like depth studies where students actually get to potentially follow, you know, their real, you know, like line um, areas of interest for their lines of inquiry. You know, so, so there are, you know, some quite new and novel things there, uh, which are quite, you know, interesting. Uh, w with regards to my, yeah, my, uh, my study, um, I began my PhD in physics education research uh, through the School of Physics at the University of Sydney back in 2010. Uh, Professor Manju Sharma, and I was investigating uh, the impact of um, technology on teaching and learning in the sciences. That was a part-time PhD, so I finally graduated April of this year. So I was, I was over the moon to do that. Um, but I, yeah, I was, it, you know, it was a hard slog, but it's an experience that I, I cherish uh, in terms of the skills I've picked up along the way and just the exposure to a new world in terms of with academia, with uh, getting published in academic journals, working uh, with academics after, you know, I, I graduated from uni back in 94. So um, I was certainly a mature age kind of a PhD student. So, yeah, it, it was a wonderful experience, but I'm very happy that it's now over. Yeah, I bet. And actually, um, we've got a number of people finishing off their PhDs at work at our place. And, um, yeah, that's pretty much the same way. We've got a few people taking some gap years and bits and pieces and I – yeah, in some ways, don't blame them. Um, you know, it's a, it is a hard slog. I mean, you've certainly got a lot of stuff to do. And, hey, once you're done, it's a good thing to look back on. And, gee, in the middle of it, though, <laughs> wow. <laughs> but actually, yeah, that brings up the point. I mean, um, yeah. there's plenty of people listening who, you know, all sorts of backgrounds and all sorts of studies they've done. Just what made you fall into science in the first place? I mean, obviously, you're very much heavily involved now. You're instructing schools and all the rest. When, well, is this something you always want to do as you went through school? Is it something that you picked up later on? I mean, what drives you? No, um, I, funnily enough, because I would go around so many schools and, you know, um, particularly in, say, primary schools, kids ask that question quite a bit. So I, I do remember distinctly, well, my dad was an industrial chemist. I mean, I didn't know what that meant when I was a kid. But I do remember distinctly, about an eight-year-old, I think my aunt got me a book called Discovering Earth, and it has loads of things in there about geology, but also about space. And just, you know, general aspects of like, you know, kids' science. And I just found that fascinating. And then once I got into high school and started doing science, you know, I had an excellent science teacher from the equivalent of uh, year seven. And 
I, I, I love science all through high school. Then I went to like the senior years, which is in a sixth form college back in the UK. Then, you know, that was really rigorous science and just, I absolutely loved it. So uh, I, I chose all the sciences and maths and extension math. You know, like, sorry, when I say all the sciences, not at all. Um, I'm not quite into, um, yeah, I get grossed out quite easily. So I shied away from biology quite early on. So I did <laughs> <laughs> physics and chemistry and maths and extension math. Yeah, just that kind of like, you know, classic combination there. And then went on to uni and I did uh, straight physics at Manchester Uni. I would have walked the same halls as uh, Brian Cox at the same time, but I never knew him. No, <laughs> oh, you could have gone that. past and gave him a high uh, five as he's going. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I, I, I sent a speculative kind of like fanboy email to him um, a few weeks back because I knew he was coming out here, uh, mentioning that, you know, I would have gone to uni with him, but uh, he never replied. So uh, never mind. Yeah, um, he's somewhat busy these days. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I was kind of guessing that. And whilst I was at uni, I'll be honest, uh, I found, I'd found school quite easy, but uni with all the distractions of freedom and sports and um, girls, I guess, I found uni a lot harder. And then during my second year, I was thinking with my limited life experience, you know, what experiences did I have in terms of choosing a career? And I thought finding school easy, but then finding things uh, hard at uni maybe being a teacher, you know, I'll be able to empathize with both, you know, the very able kids and then those kids that struggled. I thought I'd give it um, science teaching go. So I did postgraduate certificate of education at, at Warwick University and then, yeah, got my first job in 1994 in Coventry in the UK. Taught at a couple more schools in the UK and then came back, well, went back backpacking around the world. I was only meant to be in Australia briefly. I fell in love with Australia um, and then met my wife. It was, it was in that order, actually. And yeah, I was taught in Australia for eight years. And then I got some work um, with the Catholic Education Office, Sydney, uh, around e-learning. So I'd been using technology all through my teaching. But this was, say, explicitly about the use of technology across, uh, sorry, across all curriculum areas. So not just in science at all. But I was still maintaining, you know, helping out schools with science. And that's where my exposure to the needs of primary schools uh, really came about. Because there was no one supporting primary schools were science and you know those supporting high schools were you know stretched to the limits as it was we actually made representations to get people to help primary schools and um we kept getting knocked back and people were saying well why didn't you do it really yeah yeah so after a while i thought yeah i might do it but um if i'm going to do it i'm going to, I'm going to do it on my own terms <laughs> so to yeah. speak so uh, I, thought I thought i'd uh take a chance and step out and worst case scenario if i fell flat on my face as a physics teacher i you know I wouldn't be out of work for long, so to speak, but um, I haven't looked back, to be fair. I'm loving the, the sheer variety. So I've had some bizarre days of a kindergarten in the morning and then year 12 physics in the afternoon. Oh, no, absolutely. <laughs> I, I know that feeling and completely. I mean, I, I distinctly remember uh, running a preschool workshop on, let's do five senses, and yes, we have eyes, ears, nose, and <laughs> all the rest, uh, like you do, um, and then doing a DNA extraction with year 11 the next, you know, yeah two hours later <laughs> you do get that strange thing and then you end up doing a university lecture afterwards in the evening it's crazy this type of work that's right that's right but just the sheer variety of people i, th- I think that's what i really love so I'm, I'm working with kids of different ages but then adults of different ages and different experiences and abilities and confidences you know um, country people city people and uh, from all sectors so government schools catholic schools independent schools and then I'm still maintaining my relationship with the uni as well. So I'm now honorary associates. And with the new syllabus, that's actually been quite timely because being at the um, coalface, so to speak, I can actually advise the School of Physics as to, you know, what is actually happening, what teachers do need. So they're developing a lot of resources to support teachers. So, yeah, I I do enjoy the variety there. So... Balancing your time is probably a bit of an issue, I suspect, because you need it in different ways. Yeah, yeah, balancing the time, yeah, there isn't too much balance at the moment. I'm, I'm trying to find, uh, you know, le- learn those uh, those skills. But um, oh, As we uh, record this at 9.30 at night, by the way, yeah, of course. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's right. I've, so far this evening, so, you know, so far I've worked at school today and then this evening um, I've just proofread someone's course that I might be subcontracting to uh, do some professional development for me. I've just set up another one of my own courses and, you know, just various administration. Yeah, no rest for the wicked in that regard, but I, I, I enjoy my work. I enjoy working hard. And 
it's just, I guess in a way I've been in the right place at the right time. And yeah. with that, co- with that comes just a lot of work, so to speak, if you're, you know, you're working for yourself in that regard. So, Very um, much so. Like if you jump on crooked, crookedscience.com, um, just check out the collaborations that Simon's been, like, seriously, check it out. Like if you just go to the top, you just go, you know, go to the about and then drop down to, you know, what are the collaborations that's been happening with, you know, Simon and you, they are substantial and all over the place, everything from ABC splash, through to inspiring Australia and, you know, schools out as far as the road will take you. It's, um, must be a lot of fun. Yeah, it's loads of fun. It is loads of fun. I have to update that actually. <laughs> so it's going to get longer. Um, I'm hoping that physics is in there. Physics education, your, your company. And, oh. and if it isn't, I will add you guys shortly. <laughs> Look, we, but- yeah. The way I the way I see it though is like I mean everyone here and this is the beauty of and this is what I've really enjoyed about doing this particular podcast series is just finding that everyone does this cool stuff in different areas and to be honest we're all in some ways singing from the same songbook we just happen to have different notes what I mean by that is we're all trying to look after kids in different ways but. In yeah. essence, we all bring different skills to the plate. And that doesn't just mean um, people happen to be providers to schools. There are some enormously amazing school innovators who work within the classroom. And it just comes down to that we're all Absolutely. trying to do the same job, you know? Absolutely. And so, you know, like yourself, I love that variety of uh, working with lots of different people. But uh, when you start talking about the people in the classroom, I think that's where I particularly get a strength of feeling in terms of um, – I, I, re- I really want to say advocate for these, you know, fantastic teachers in the classroom. And in some schools, they're getting all the support and, and more, and, and they are thriving in it uh, with it. And but then in other places, for various reasons, maybe within the school or bigger than the school or whatever, they're perhaps feeling a bit stifled or underappreciated, um, or yeah. you know, various I- things like that. So w- where possible, I try to advocate for them and you know to help them out and perhaps connect them with like-minded people so they can help each other. Wherever, I mean, these PLNs, these professional learning networks, are so critical. I mean, you can jump on the yeah. Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever. Actually, you just bring bring up a. Um, I was chatting with a bloke, and I've got to be really careful how I, how I place this, of course, because um, yeah, for, you know, for obvious reasons. But the I was speaking with this amazing innovator um around stem and um i mean stem is very broad i mean let's say it's, you know, to be honest it's yet another label but um this particular bloke is rocking it and more and rocking it at a um a state level like lots of people are really involved in, in what he does and um, i asked well geez mate your school must be just loving your work and he gave me this look going you'd, you'd think so wouldn't you <laughs> And I went, oh, I wonder, you know, gee, I wonder what that what that nerve is. But I dive a little bit deeper without, you know, trying to cause any trouble. And just so, what, what does that mean? He goes, well, um, I've got a couple of friends there, but it's this. It's, I don't know. It's I wonder, and I'd love to know. There'll be listeners listening in who might, you know, this might be striking a chord. I'd love to know. I don't in any way have a solution to this, but I must say, and then you would see the same. So I'm mean, going to many, 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 many schools this is not an isolated thing that you see occasionally. It's, it's kind of a little sad sometimes, but at the same point, other ways you'll see these wicked schools, these awesome schools that are clearly collaborating, not only with themselves, but with whole groups. I mean, one of the ones that reminds me right now, sorry, I was kind of like, I want to interview, but I'm just remembering these particular stories. There's this no, no, awesome please, please. group. I want to do this shout out to this group out at the snow, out of the snowy mountain. So uh, those people are overseas. We have a, we do have a mountain range. Occasionally, Australia does occasionally have snow. <laughs> Every now and then, we call them the snowy mountains. And maybe you might laugh because there's not much to, to do with some sort of snow. But anyway, we have snowy mountains, and in the snowy mountains, there are these collegiate schools of which might only have thirty kids each. That's about it. But they've been meeting on a term by term basis where they do overnight camps. It could be in any area. It could be history, science, maths, art, doesn't matter. I have not ever seen such a far better network than that where they're actually, you know, yep. individual schools meeting on a 10-week basis and also then, you know, use video conferencing to catch up and whatnot. That is a support network. Yes, yes. Uh, absolutely. And um, I'll be honest, that's one of the reasons why I like working so much in the country is particularly in the country people are literally so isolated, you know, they, they need, you know, they, they just professionally and physically need these support networks. So where they do work cohesively, um, they're fantastic. And where they don't exist, I really try to encourage people um, to set them up. But it's interesting, like I'll run some PD up on the North Coast and there'll be people who travel five hours to attend it. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, 
in years gone by, I've run things in Sydney, and people complain about having to travel out of the eastern suburbs. Oh, mate. Well, we did this program. (laughs) We did this day, and, like, you're a tech tech education guy, so you'd be loving this. We did this robotics program for PD at Condell Park Public School. There you go, guys. If you're listening, Condell Park, you're rocking it. They had schools from the local area, but they also had um, a school from the Riverine area. I mean, they actually flew in for this day. And not only were they doing PD – um, you know, you know, PD is PD, you know, teachers teaching teachers in the right, but they brought some kids along. And this is where I thought it was so cool because all of a sudden they could just watch how the students could interact on a different idea. Now, this is not anything to do with NASA. And no, I get that. It's not about endorsement. It was just simply about what works and let's find out from the students themselves rather than thinking we can know and then find out and test later. And the students were teaching the teachers. I thought it was just a fantastic, fantastic program. Absolutely. Going back to those people who perhaps don't feel appreciated locally, I think there's probably a bit of tall poppy syndrome, you know, which is quite big in Australia. But I, I think, you know, you read a lot about the industrial model of uh, education and all the rest of this. I, I do believe that um, there's room for a bit of disruption, shall we say. So just the, the, the classic model of the only education happens between teachers and students in a school where particularly where you need subjects um, specialism and expertise and you need to you know we we, we want equity of access uh, for all students I think there's room for people are doing things slightly differently and without trying to sort of like sound uh, I don't know what the phrase is here but you know but talking yourself up and, and, and talking my work up like there's room for that I mean you only have to look at how busy we are in terms of the, the demand from schools. I think perhaps institutions are being a bit slower to recognize that fact. Like we're not undermining them. You know, we're, we're complementing the work that they do. And to be fair, a lot of institutions have had their resources slashed. Well, so, a, you know, their regional advisors, you know. This is a real groundswell that's getting some genuine momentum right now. I mean, actually, we, um, I wasn't able to attend. I was so disappointed. But uh, Holly Kershaw from work was able to go pop, pop down to Melbourne yes. for EduChange. And EduChange is run by Education Changemakers and ran a very interesting program yeah. whereby they had all these people from all over the world uh, just looking at what can they do to innovate. And so it would be worth just checking out. I know it's episode 23 of this podcast, which is quick three-minute excerpts, not just only from the speakers, but from people on the floor who are doing these cool things at their local schools and listening to the interviews, you can just hear that these people are innovators, yet they don't even realize it. And they're only just starting to realize yeah. that there's these cool little networks that actually exist. And it's not always about the person in the limelight. There are genuinely people making genuinely huge differences, but they've got a bit of the, oh, shucks, it's, oh, it's just little old me. But to be honest, they're actually doing a fantastic job. Um, yeah, it's definitely That's worth right. checking that out. And it, it's amazing what's actually out there if we you know, got to know more. Absolutely, and I think uh, just on that front as well, I know some of the people like uh, Summer Harris uh, who work for them, uh, and she's absolutely fantastic. But teach meets, yes. I mean, you go along to just a, a little teach meet, you know, forty people there. What you hear from, you know, just uh, perhaps uh, an introverted teacher down the road to what they're doing in the classroom, absolutely fantastic stuff. And, and often this stuff is better than what you see at you know great big massive conferences. I mean, there's one conference that will remain unnamed very very heavily advertised and they're actually almost trying to um i've got to be careful what i say here but <laughs> people have been hosting teach me at these conferences and the conference has been benefiting from the teach me more than the teach me benefiting from the conference shall we say so yeah, but kudos you know, the thing is i agree with teach-me. what you're sort of saying with these teach me because i know some of the best ones i mean i know there are pl- there are people listening all over the world that you know there are different places of having different meets but i must say in australia and knowing what australians are some of the best teach meets frankly are in the pub or in the local community center or mm-hmm. in the scout hall or in the school hall after school where it's just yeah. people just taking off their school ties for a moment and just being normal and like i know that, i mean obviously there are different ways to approach it and i'm clearly an informal person but it's when you break down those barriers and get away from the lectern that actually real learning happens. That's right. That's right. And uh, if you chat to you and Macintosh, uh, he'll tell you that the very first teach meet happens in a pub in Edinburgh. Yeah. 
So uh, actually, yeah. I was going to ask you about this, and we went down a different rabbit hole. But I, I want to go back to this. I never got a chance to speak uh, teach in England, and I, you know, maybe I'll get to do it one yeah. one day. I certainly got to teach in summer camps in California. Um, and, you know, been face to face in different ways to students all over the world using video conferencing. But I've never been in the classroom in England. Now you've had that chance, and you, I just love to know just compare and contrast. I mean, if it's for listeners that may have never done that, I mean, what, what's it like? What's the differences? What are the similarities? That type of thing. Okay, it's well. First of all, I've been over here now for fifteen years, so I think things have changed a lot since <laughs> a over there since uh, since I was there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's look, it's not that different. You know, kids are kids. Uh, yeah. What I would say, particularly for Australian listeners, is um, things are more traditional here in Australia, and more old school. So, for example, uniforms a lot more daggy over here than back in the UK. Like the right. girls wear stuff. You know, they were the same as the boys, you know, like with a jumper, a tie, maybe a skirt or kilt, but, you know, like they could be wearing trousers like the boys. Right. Whereas over here, particularly in New South Wales, actually, and this is part of the history of Australia, but there's so many single sex schools over here. You know, most things in the UK are co-ed. Um, another big organizational difference is um, Catholic schools in the UK are government schools that teach, you know, religion. but the people who pay your wage are the local education authority, you know, which is like the local council. Right. Um, whereas here, they're a very distinct, you know, separate system, again, because of history in Australia and sectarianism and things like that. So I found those things, you know, quite um, strange. In terms of, I mean, you know, kids are kids. They are. Although, obviously, that they can behave differently in, say, co-ed settings, single sex settings, single sex settings. But then the, in terms of curriculum, this is where I don't, I haven't really bothered paying attention to what it's like over there now. Um, and I do believe there's been a whole lot of fads in recent years, which Australia seems to be following um, and perhaps shouldn't be um, if you listen to the researchers. But um, certainly the curricula that I did at school and what I taught before I came out here was, you know, like quite rigorous and quite mathematical, we're talking about the physics didn't quite have to say the, uh, the, the social aspects that we uh, currently have. Then again, the flip side, there's some things that are say in the HSC syllabus here that I didn't do till uni. So special relativity. I mean, if there's international listeners, I mean, some people might be surprised to see that's, you know, being studied by 17 year olds in the school. That's uh, it difficult enough to teach, to teach to a first or second year physics student sometimes. I mean, that's I'm going right. to get the I'm going to get the quote wrong. I'll probably I'll go go look it up. So and Carl Sagan was talking about about you can have people in a university course that still don't quite understand the mechanics between the Earth, Sun, and Moon. Like there is a more important quote than that, but I never remember quotes properly. But <laughs> the the point yeah. is is that you can never assume that um, the learner in front of you actually knows what you're, you're actually talking about. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely, and um, so that's that's where we need to really work on things like you know critical thinking and problem solving. It's not just rote learning facts and things, you know. And we need to be able to apply and work things out from first principles. So yeah, th- th- those skills are, are very very important. Are oh, those um, but, the project based learning thing? This whole make a movement thing. Anything where kids solve the problem and then ask you the question. Going, Hang on, I need. To, I, it's almost like they're asking for. You know, like if you're working on a whatever it is you're working on, just say you're working on an engine and you know that you need a, a particular tool to remove something or to add something to the engine. What I love watching is yeah. when learners are working on a particular problem and it doesn't have to be a building thing, it could be something else, and they kind of turn to you and go, look, I just need to know how to work out this thing. Can you show me how to give me this thing and I'll go back to what I'm doing? What they're really doing yeah. is they're asking for a knowledge-based tool. And they're the ones that actually realizing yeah. they're, might be deficient in this area, but more importantly, because they know they need it, they want to learn it. And I just love how it's not just here, I'm going to ram this textbook down your throat just for a little while, <laughs> it's, as opposed to yeah. just this idea of just students going, you know what, I actually need this. I've just discovered that I need this thing. It's really cool. Yes, yes. Um, and actually on that, you reminded me, I mean, I mentioned my work with uh, primary schools around the new syllabus there and the high schools around the new syllabus there. Um, a lot of the work that I've got uh, that's been coming up uh, and I've been developing in the last couple of years has been around um, STEM, particularly with gifted students in kind of upper primary and lower secondary. And that's very much around identifying real-world problems that they want to solve. 
So uh, I was at a school this morning, uh, so a big shout out to St Ambrose in Concord West. With their, it's called their Newman Stream, where they, we got some year four to year six students, and they're actually going to be having a, a showcase of their work um, in two weeks' time. And absolutely fantastic. Just the actual process they've gone through in terms of identifying problems, um, looking at solutions, looking at a variety of solutions, whistling down to the best solutions, looking at what's already out there, the competition. And um, there's some really, really fascinating ones out there. Um, there's, oh. there's some girls there. So, so the school's quite kind of landlocked, so to speak. Uh, it's got houses all the way around it. And so kids are always kicking balls over into the neighbor's um, uh, garden. Now, so the girls are developing chips to go inside balls that uh, you know work on Bluetooth and so to help you locate them. And they're even looking to extend it to almost like make it a bit like a Sphero within, so it can actually start rolling back to you. That's really you know, cool. Fire an app on your phone. And like, you know, these are year four, five, six, girls who identified a problem of that, you know, that, that's a problem they've experienced. We, we certainly didn't suggest it to them, but they've developed it and their prototype that they've developed um, is, is fantastic. I mean, we're not actually expecting in terms of products anything of particularly high quality because we want the actual, um, to, it to be more about the process than just like a the make part of, say, design and make or anything. But they've actually made this cross-section of a ball and they're labeling all the different parts in terms of the chip is and the antenna and uh, power source and various things like that. And um, very, very good. Yeah, That's very clever. brilliant. There's so many different examples. I mean, I remember uh, I was talking with a team with uh, Makers Empire out of South Australia. Uh, they run 3D printing courses via, through software and people can divide, do all this kind of cool stuff on their um, apps and then get the print either with them or with, um, you know, with your printer at home at the school. And, um, they were telling me, recounting me the story where um, the, the students came across a situation where the teachers, uh, um, you know, I think it was a young daughter, I believe, I'm just trying to remember now, where the child had this difficulty. It basically, it was a disability. And could they make something to help the child? And yes. that's exactly what they did. Uh, yeah, actually, you know, just jump on the physics p- p- uh, website, type in Maker's Empire. I guarantee you'll find the podcast somewhere. I can't remember what the um, episode number is. But uh, we're just listening to this story about how kids in primary school were effectively being biomedical engineers. I'm <laughs> just going, yes. wow, that is cool. Actually, I've, I've got a very similar story. Um, so I'm doing another s- similar activity out at uh, St. Felix in um, Bankstown. Now, that's just with the year five and six students, but there's a very gifted boy in year four in a nearby school, Christ the King in Bass Hill. And the principal heard about our program and asked if he could join the program. He's been absolutely fantastic. Now, the, pro- the problem he's identified, uh, his uncle has MS, and he's, he, you know, he's seen if you like the demise of his uncle and you know like what goes first so to speak and um he was just thinking about how to help people with ms so he's actually developing an exoskeleton for the hand and the forearm that can actually be linked up uh with electrodes to nerve endings that do work further up the arm in the upper arm and as you say like he's, he's a bio you know mechanical engineer like it's it's incredible yeah, that's so, just um, awesome. And it just reminds me, like, well, I'm just thinking about this. I would guarantee you there'd be listeners here and all the people we run into that they were, would have run into countless stories of this. And it kind of gets me thinking, there almost needs to be a portal for these stories. Um, I know that Brett Salakis from Aussie Ed fame on Twitter, if just type in hashtag Aussie Ed, I guarantee yep. you'll come across Brett. You know, he set up World STEM so that people could share their, their way they do experiments in a couple of minutes, almost like Alan Alder's flame challenge in some ways, just without the challenge. Or maybe there, I think there was actually a challenge in there, I believe. But the idea is I kind of wonder just, just what is actually out there. And literally it could be within your own suburb and you wouldn't even know it. Yeah, and actually, so yeah, I mean, I suppose just for now, I mean, I just encourage listeners who you know, know someone doing cool stuff, or even if you're doing some stuff, let people know about it. Um, it might actually change a, a, another child's life. 
Uh, absolutely, and I think it's it's all that power of networking and collaborating, and as you said, as a as a PLN, as a professional. But um, you know, we could be talking parents, you know, uh, carers, uh, and students. You know, if if they um, happen across you know such opportunities or ideas uh, or experts or initiatives, whatever it might be, then you know, that will be helping them if all of these, yeah, as you say, if there's some kind of central place or some way of communicating and sharing things for everybody, that'd be excellent. I guess, um, like, what's always nice though when you share stories, uh, people often think it's got, always got to be about the good stories. I tell you what, there's a lot to be said about here's what I messed up. <laughs> here's what I totally went pear shaped. <laughs> Don't do this. Pretty good idea. If you want, you can try. You can find out it doesn't work. <laughs> I mean, I almost feel like I'm sort of putting you on yeah. the spot. It turns out I probably am putting you on the spot. But have you ever had, like, you know, when you think back through all your teaching years or even when you do professional development, it doesn't really matter. Um, is, is there ever been a time you're going, you know what? This, ain't, this lesson ain't working. <laughs> it's not where I thought it was going to go. Have you ever had like a genuine clangor and you going, you know what, I won't do that again? Yeah, yeah, I have. I'll, I'll, I'll have to have a think as to um, like some, some, some big ones there. So you just reminded me of, it's kind of a funny story. So, I mean, it is a bit of a clangor. When I was working in the Catholic Education Office, um, there were some renovations going on. So we used to have to run our PD out of schools because, you know, the uh, the training rooms were you know, like being gutted. And I remember one time I was doing, um, it was an e-learning coordinators network along with the curriculum coordinators in schools, actually trying to get the curriculum leaders to talk to the technology leaders, which doesn't always happen. So the lady responsible for the curriculum coordinators and myself, you know, we co-ran this thing. The nature of, uh, say, meetings in Catholic schools is they might start with a prayer. Now, I was running things through my computer and I had like the PowerPoints, but she was in charge of the prayer and there's some music to go with it. And it was, so we'd play it and my computer defaulted to iTunes. Right. So there's this kind of like somber moment and, you know, people are reflecting and you know, they play this little, I don't know, bits of mu- you know, music or whatever. And then, you know, there's a lull and it's the end. And then she started and, you know, she was, if you like, you know, the, uh, the first to speak. And she had everyone's attention. She was just there. I was at the back of the library, uh, you know, because I wasn't going to be speaking for about an hour. I didn't realize that uh, iTunes was just going to continue playing. And it was on shuffle. Right. And I had 10,000 songs on, on my computer. And of all the songs to kick in, just as we had this somber moment, it suddenly goes, give it to me, baby. Oh, uh-huh. no. <laughs> and I just had to leg it from the back of the library. <laughs> and she's looking around herself. Um, just trying to stop the computer. But in terms of absolute clangers, in terms of things I've done <laughs> that have just gone absolutely pear shaped, yeah, I, I should. Oh, that's okay. No, that totally. But I, the... Look, I, I, look, I, 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 def- I definitely have done. I mean, well, the tech side. Look, look, there be p- plenty of people who resonate. Like, while, while you're sort of thinking about, there be plenty of people who resonate with exactly this type of issue. In fact, when you were describing that, I couldn't help but picture. I think it's an old ad. I can't remember. What it was like a telco or something like that. Oh, maybe I got it wrong. People can just tell me later on. But they, um, they're at a funeral, and then someone thought the best thing to play would be ACDC. Everyone looked at them funny, and then they realized, actually, you know what? This is actually this person's song. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how you could actually make the offspring actually fit with a somber uh, church moment. <laughs> but, um, you know, you, you, things roll on, and, you know, the world's okay. I mean, I, I often sometimes measure, like, the yeah. idea of, if no one remembers two years later, was it really that bad? <laughs> yeah. I've just remembered a couple of things. One's more a case of um, just bad teaching as opposed to, you know, like trying something new and it all went badly. Uh, in my very first year of teaching, um, so, you know, you, you're really shattered in your first year of teaching and, you know, marking isn't, you know, why we signed up for the job, so to speak. And I had a pile of year seven to mark. And mm-hmm. uh, we'd just been doing... Um, sex ed and they had some sex ed homework and I think the way it was in that school there was like a worksheet or something and like it had loads of questions a stupid amount of questions it was just so much marking to do so I just I was just a very bad teacher that night and I just basically ticked most things just thinking you know I don't want any blowback yep Did, didn't think anything more of it gave it you know all the uh, the work back Anyway, um, a few days later, I got a, a letter from a parent uh, basically saying, you know, looking at 
all the answers that I'd ticked correct that her child had um, answered, which were totally incorrect. And she was actually being really nice and saying, look, you may not know some of these things about, you know, the, the female reproductive system. Um, you know, but I'm a nurse, you know, perhaps I could tell you some of these things. <laughs> no. You know, but, uh, you, you, you know, it's just like, oh, God, this is awful. So, you know, that's just me being a, a but, teacher. But you know but, what? Um, what a great parent. I mean, she could have, you know, yeah, oh, lovely, taken yeah. you to town, but she <laughs> went, you know, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and help this poor bloke. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> she took pity on me. Mm. Um, I, I used to have this... Um, kind of extravaganza thing called a wall of flame, which I mentioned in passing to Derek Muller Veritasium because he was in our research group before he became really, really famous. Mm. Um, and I believe he's actually made a video of it. Is this Probably the, uh, not the Rubens tube, but like the, two, the, the uh, 2D plate with flame? No, no, it's, it's slightly different. So it, it's actually the whole notion of um, rates of reaction with, say, surface area and ah. why say why, why say dust fires or um, sawdust fires are particularly dangerous so what i would do is um, get a very long hose so if you're going to do this please do the risk assessment because i don't want to get into trouble if anyone does this incorrectly you get a very long hose to the gas tap so you get the bumps and burn on the floor you stand on the bench if you're allowed to stand on the bench with your risk assessment um, and you have say a beaker with some coffee mace Okay, so it's just coffee white now. You know, it's just loaded of carbohydrate. Yep. And you just sprinkle it. And it wafts down, it ignites at the bottom, and with, you know, convection, you know, the, the, the heat is transferred upwards. And it all ignites. And it's called the wall of flame. And um, there's a couple of things that's actually gone wrong twice. You think, how could I do it wrong twice? The first time I did it wrong was I was in uh, a school back in the UK, and I didn't quite realize that they had lower ceilings in this lab. And right. I had a little bit too much... Um, coffee mates in there so it sprinkled down when I hit the ceiling and then spread in every direction including towards me so I turned away and disappeared in a cloud of smoke and then half the class were laughing their heads off and half the class were really worried and when it subsided I kind of singed my hair a bit uh, and then at my last school over here very early on uh, I did this uh, with the class and like you know it's not just showing up like there's a lot of learning to be done here I actually well I didn't realize the spot I'd chosen to do it was directly under the heat sensor. So oh, that's right. smoke detector because it's a science lab, but they had heat sensors. And so I set up the fire alarms. And so the whole school has to get evacuated. And, yeah. um, you know, that, that costs schools a lot of money, you know, like it's hundreds of dollars per fire truck and several turned up. But fortunately for me, the principal was a science teacher and she was looking to raise the profile of science. And she kind of said afterwards, she goes, no one's going to forget that one. Yeah, that's so, true. Um, it, 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 and, um, and just for the listeners at home, there, are, there is another way where like, we actually do a, a similar version of that um, experiment, but which involves you not being on top of the desk, which is kind of the way around it. A way around it is if you have the flame uh, coming out sideways, uh, you just have it, um, you know, in a way that it can't fall down. There's, you know, usually we have a volunteer in full PPE for full protective equipment holding it, you know, face shield, yeah. gloves, well, everything works. And you you have a hose, like as you per you say, in a funnel, and you angle the funnel in such a way that it doesn't actually have the flame go anywhere near anyone, um, and it goes upwards, yes. and there's no one above it. The only issue is, I completely agree with what you said. Risk assessments, people, <laughs> yeah, and really, like, uh, don't do what Donny don't does. Like, it's really a uh, when you watch someone running a science show presentation like that, or you see someone on YouTube, it's, it's hopefully, and quite often, especially in this proper museum, it's not their first day. And they've had a lot of people actually go through many different ways of how it could go wrong. And, and weirdly, of all yeah. things, the most dangerous part about that is the slipping hazard of the fine powder on the floor left afterwards. So, yeah, there's your disclaimer. We're not actually telling you how to do the experiment, but let's be honest, we're all grown-ups. We know that yeah. you can go Google this stuff. Just think carefully about what you're actually doing first. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely, yeah. But it's good fun. I mean, so um, just out of interest, I mean, obviously you've been, you've been doing this for many, many years and you're helping out lots of people. I mean, if you had, I don't know, a cohort of um, brand new science teachers, this, they, I don't know, they're given, you've, got like, you've got five minutes of their time before they walk into their class for their very first week of teaching away mm -hmm. from the universities. What sort of advice mm -hmm. would you give these students, these no longer students, let's be honest, they're literally about to be employed. They're starting in five minutes. What, what, what sort of advice would you give these people? Okay. Um, well, to those who are entering primary teaching, I would tell them they don't need to be experts in the knowledge. They don't need to know everything. 
but they do need to be very familiar with the skills. So here in New South Wales, it's working scientifically because if they are familiar with the skills, then they can ultimately design their own experiments or have a better understanding about how experiments work. So they can impart those skills onto their students. The students have a better understanding about how experiments work and ultimately they can design their own experiments. So I think that's one of the big things um, I do try to impart uh, with primary teachers. With high school teachers, if they're going in fresh, and, and sorry, I'd say this to all teachers, primary and high school, make it hands-on and engaging. Um, you know, no student wants to sit there and just be spoken at and just to work from a textbook. Here's the thing. If you're going into high school as a new science teacher, chances are you're not going to get the senior grade straight away because you might not have the experience and a lot of the more experienced teachers want to keep them for themselves. So you're going to get the junior grades. New teachers can offer so much to those junior grades just with their, you know, kind of dynamism and um, engagement. And it, it is a problem in the Western world, and there's a lot of research to back this up, that uh, a lot of students you know, students leave primary school, go into high school, but they can't wait to do science. You know, they want to do bunts and burners and they want to see all the glassware. They want to do experiments. Yet by the end of year seven, and certainly by the end of year eight, over half them can't stand science. Now, that's a sad indictment of lower secondary kind of science education, but it's, there's various reasons for it. Um, and it's quite intimidating when you have a class of, you know, 30 plus, you know, 13 uh, year olds uh, facing you. But if um, a former colleague of mine had this phrase, engage me or enrage me. So if they're engaged, like, you know, you've won out. Like, um, you're not going to have to deal with as many classroom management issues because it's hands-on, because they're going to be really, really enjoying it. So, um, yeah, that'd be my advice there. I love that advice, engage me or enrage me. That's just brilliant because, I mean, I know like we've taught in juvenile justice centers and also even maximum security prisons. And I mean, so we're, we're talking to people have been you know, more than just a bit naughty. And yet if it's engaging, it's not actually as big a deal as it sounds in any way. Um, and so yeah. that is very, very, very true. Um, love it. No, thank you very much. And uh, look, and th- again, thank you very much for, popping in on this podcast considering that it is late at night and you just looked over it yet more papers and bits and pieces look much appreciated and look i know there'll be some people who want to get in touch uh how would they do that okay so um you can go to my website which is uh, crookedscience.com and there's all kinds of information as you mentioned before in the about and they can read about various things there i'm also on twitter as simon crook um, I'm occasionally on Instagram as Simon.crook, um, and there's a Crooked Science Facebook page as well. So, um, yeah, there's, there's, there's plenty of ways. Um, I'm on LinkedIn and things like that. Um, and I'm sure people can track down my email address as well. Um, yeah, no worries. Which, no, we'll, if you want it. Yeah, if they throw yeah. it down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's just Simon at SimonCrook.com. And that was very so, um, enigmatic and very hard to work out. So, <laughs> But the but the good news is about this. Look, right. You know, the beauty about uh, show links is that show notes is that we can we will do that. We'll link all those uh, links in the show notes. And you can definitely check that out. And um, look, much appreciated. No doubt you'll be out at schools tomorrow and the next day, or the, sorry, not the next day. It's yep. The weekend coming. Hey, maybe you've got some weekend stuff. But um, look, I know that it is. A, it's not quite a wind down for you as you come into the end of the year because frankly, you've got a whole syllabus to help implement and um i know there'll be uh physics teachers right across the state and beyond uh, loving your work on that so um look much appreciated and uh we'll catch you another time yeah absolutely ben thank you i appreciate it this is the physics ed podcast we're all about science ed tech and more to see 100 fun free experiments you can do with your class go to physicseducation.com.au that's physics spelled F-I-Z-Z-I-C-S. And click 100 free experiments. Well, there you go. That was Dr. Simon Crook from Crooked Science. And certainly he's got a lot to say and share with schools. And certainly after traveling all over Australia, that is definitely the case. I'd love to know what you found out of that conversation. And that's why we chatted for so long, because he had a lot to say. And it was quite interesting listening in. In fact, from that, I definitely got away three top learnings. Number one for me, work with people who have different backgrounds. Work with people from the country, from the city, from regional and remote areas – 
try and connect with people who have different opinions from you. It's actually quite interesting because it doesn't really matter so much if they're highly experienced or less experienced. Sometimes it's their own backgrounds that'll help shape a conversation in a different way and you'll be able to get more knowledge from it. And that's certainly important. Hey, number two from me was go to teach meets. In fact, that's exactly where you can meet new people, funnily enough. Look up teach meets on the internet in your local area. I'd nearly guarantee there'd be something out there. And look, if there's nothing hanging around in your local area, jump on Twitter, look up PLNs, look up professional learning networks that exist. Just type up Ed Chat or Ed Talk or Ed something. Look all the different hashtags up. Many of them just go onto Google and type in hashtags for education. You will find them. This way you can meet up with people who have, yeah, it'll be great to speak with people with similar backgrounds, but it's good to meet people with different backgrounds. And finally, and this is something that Simon very much mentioned, if you can teach the fundamentals of how experiments actually work, how scientists actually work scientifically, it's from there that kids will be able to make their own experiments. And you know what? That means that they really understand what science is all about. And to be honest, kids will love to do their own investigations. That's actually what the syllabus and curriculums are all actually about. And you'll know that you've done your job really, really well and the kids will have a lot of fun doing it. Thanks for listening to the Physics Ed Podcast. Sign up now for our fortnightly email newsletter. It's loaded with details on new experiments you can do, STEM teaching articles, new gadgets, exclusive offers and upcoming events. Go to physicseducation.com.au. Scroll to the bottom and add your email. And that brings us to the end of yet another Physics Ed podcast. However, there's still much, 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 much more to come because we've been doing so many interviews as this year wraps up. We've just got to get it out to you. And certainly uh, in the coming weeks, we've got Joanna Howes. If you haven't met Joanna before, she is from Science Historical and she happened to win Alan Alder's Flame Challenge. And uh, if you don't know what the Flame Challenge is all about, go check out Flame Challenge, Alan Alder, into Google or your favourite search engine. You get to find out what that's all about. And she won it, which is going to be very, very interesting. Uh, we're speaking with Craig McGrogan from Reef HQ. That is from the Great Barrier Reef Aquarium up in Townsville. That'll be quite interesting, as well as Margaret Shepherd from the Science Teacher Association of New South Wales and many more guests, certainly. So, until then, I hope I catch up with you next week. You've been listening to me, Ben Newsom from Physics Education, and you've been listening to the Physics Ed Podcast. I'll catch you next time.